honor and privilege of just being together today. We pray that every question will be directly from the heart of God and every answer will be God breathed, that it will be thus say the Lord. We're not interested in religious trash. We're not interested in what man has to say. We want to hear the word of the Lord for us on this day in 2013, the year of our Lord Jesus Christ. We want to find out the direction, the will, the leading of the spirit and what your word says. We want to know the truth. Nothing but the truth. Amen. Right, guys? One of the major um, doctrines that's coming out of the grace movement today is inclusion, um, Trinitarianism, and then going all the way into universalism. Mm -hmm. Could you touch on, I, I read your statement on that, but uh, just how they use scriptures in Romans 5 and just basically trying to justify um, all people being saved. I think the, the easiest way to start off with is if you start reading their books and listen to their uh, discussions, their discourses, their reasoning, uh, most of the time it's a reasonable or it's a reasoning gospel. Like Jesus said to the Pharisees, why do you reason in your hearts? So Christianity is a believing thing, not a reasoning thing. So the Pharisees were always reasoning, you know. Is this the Son of God? You know, if he does this, what will he do then? So this is the, uh, what they do. Is that, is they're always reasoning. They don't have, they're arguing. They haven't got a point to state. They don't put believe in. They take a scripture and they would say, uh, and, and God reconciled everything in heaven and on earth with himself. But the next word says to those who believe. So they stop before those who believe. You see, so if we come to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, to, you know where they say God has reconciled the world unto himself. So they say there it is, the world has been reconciled unto himself. But we've got to start with chapter, with chapter 5 verse 1, you know. We can actually start with chapter 4, you know, uh, say verse 13 or verse 5 through 7 where it says God commanded the light to shine and shone forth the illuminating light of the gospel in our hearts so that the excellency of the power can be shown to be of God and not of us. And then it goes on to say, uh, because we have believed we speak, as it is written, they have believed, therefore we speak, therefore they speak. If you take verse 1, it says, as we have received mercy... So we got to receive mercy first. He says, then we don't go for the things of the world. And then back to chapter 5, he says, I long to be clothed with my body from on high. And then verse 11 says, because we know the fear of God, we come to you and say, be reconciled with God. You know, so it's easy to take the portions, you know, God has reconciled the world, you know, from verse 18 through 20. But verse 11 starts with, because we know the fear of the Lord. We beg you, be reconciled with God. And, and then Paul says, he goes so far to say, is when I'm beside myself, it's all for God's glory. But when I come to my sane mind, it's for your sake. To try to get you because of your reasoning. Please be reconciled with God. And then he goes on to say, verse 17, If any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, they've all become. And then the world has been reconciled. And then verse 21, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us. So, and then, so that we could be made, not that we are, that we could be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So the whole book of Romans, from chapter 3 especially, uh, right up to chapter 8, it's all the time to those who believe, to those who believe, to those who believe. I mean, uh, the wages of sin is still death, but the gift of God is still eternal life. So what is the gift of God? John chapter 3, verse 14 through 16. You know, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so the Son of Man will be lifted up. You know, so, uh, so because God so loved the world that he gave, there's a gift, his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him 
should not perish, so there is a perishing, but should have eternal life or everlasting life. So if you don't believe, you perish. If you believe, you have eternal life. And then he repeats the same scripture, God so loved the world that he gave us, so he repeats it twice, you know. And Nicodemus still try struggle to believe it because he's a Pharisee. You know, verse 1, and Nicodemus that belonged to the Pharisees came and said, uh, Master, we perceive that you are a man of God, for no man can do these miracles except God be with him. And Jesus said to him, Nicodemus, it doesn't matter if you see it all. You must be born again. And Nicodemus then starts his reasoning because he's a Pharisee. You know, how can a man be born again? But if you speak to a sinner, they don't reason about being born again. They just said, wow, yes, Jesus come into my life, forgive me my sin, you know. And if, if a righteous person, 1 John chapter 1, uh, if we say we have no sin, we lie. But if we confess our sin, he is rightful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If a righteous man sin and he still need to ask forgiveness, how much more a sinner need to say, Lord, forgive me my sin. Now, back to, to John 16. A sinner don't have sins. He sinned because he's a sinner. That's his character. So he doesn't confess, oh God, when I was four, I did this. When I was ten. I mean, it's going to take him all his life to repent. So a sinner needs to repent from the fact that he's a sinner. And Jesus says what it is, John chapter 16 from verse 8. You know, when the Holy Spirit comes, he shall convict sin, righteousness, and judgment of sin because they do not believe in me. That's the only sin an unbeliever has. Of righteousness because I go to my Father. Of judgment because the prince of this world has been judged. What was his judgment? He was cast out of heaven. He's got no more place in heaven. So we have no accuser. That's why we have no condemnation. You see? So it's all the time to those who believe. And to those who don't believe, perishing. In short. Yeah, I think it's, um, this subject is like becoming a critical subject in our present day. Um, and to have a lack of understanding here, you can really be duped. And what happens is you, you slide into this apathy that it's all done, it's all mine. And the next thing you know, you're sliding into a position and place where you're being taken advantage of all the time because you have no sense of diligence, no sense of purpose, no sense of building the kingdom of God. And yet, if you look at the apostles and all the disciples, they were busy with it. They were praying. They were seeking God. They were calling for everything that has been done in Christ to be released in the earth. So I like to break it down this way. There's like two parts to this thing that make it simple for me. One is the legal and the other is the vital. So um, legally, Jesus died for the whole world. He didn't die for just those of us who are saved. He has already paid the price for every single man, woman, and child on the earth. And those who are to come, he's already paid for them as well. So legally, he has reconciled the world, but it's legal. So it remains in the heavenly realm and it is, cannot be released to the earth without faith being evolved. So it sits there as a finished fact, as a principle. And therefore, we are compelled to go everywhere in the world to announce to the world, this thing has been laid up for you in Christ Jesus. It's a free gift. Come and receive it. And so we announce to them, when their faith kicks in, they call upon God, and then it vitally becomes a fact in their life. And now that thing begins to liberate and strengthen and bring a person into the encounter of everything Christ died for. Hallelujah. Okay, so we sit with long discussions, and this is my question. Why do you preach? Why would you preach if all are saved? If I don't have to preach... now. Uh, Paul says, you know, woe is unto me if I don't preach this gospel. If I don't have to preach, I'll go do car racing. Don't look like it. I would love to go race a car. I would love to be on a racetrack. You know, I love motor cars. I love performance. I love V8 motor power under me. Uh, why must I go to people and preach? Yeah? Why must I go to the rural areas and tell them Jesus loves them? If all is saved, why must I do it? And here's the thing, uh, the inclusive doctrine is Judaism in another form. The Watchtower Society and Judaism preach the same thing according to the dead. If you die and you're not in the kingdom, you're dead. But if you die and you're in the kingdom, you have a second chance like uh, when the coming of Christ is, you will be then in the kingdom. 
And this you can check out on the internet. Judaism, Watchtower Society, the Je Jehovah Witnesses, uh, and inclusive. Their basic doctrine is the same. The dead goes to a place where they lie. And then in the resurrection, some come out, some don't come out. And those that don't come out are dead. They don't preach that, but that is their basic doctrine. So why do we preach if there is no salvation? Okay, I think we know that. Right, question. Uh, with that, there's been a lot of talk about heaven and hell, and hell um, being talked about as a place um, outside of Jerusalem in a valley and not about an actual place. Can you touch a little bit on that? Yeah, again, the reasoning, because it's a reasoning thing. If hell is outside Jerusalem, the garbage place where they burnt everything, then it means for three days Jesus was burning outside Jerusalem where everybody could see him on the trash heap. He didn't burn outside Jerusalem. They closed the grave and nobody could see what happened to him. And we know you went down and preached, you know, to those that were disobedient. Not to save them, to tell them they could have believed, you know. So it was to enforce to them the thing that they've been going through. It wasn't to get them out of purgatory and put them now into heaven, you know. So... Uh, if hell is not a real place, then what happened to Korog, Dayton, and Abiram, those band members in the days of Moses? Remember, they didn't want to receive Aaron as leader and high priest. They didn't want to receive Moses. They said we should have stayed in Egypt. And Moses stood up and he said, if God does something today that he has not done yet, then let it be known that God has called me. The Bible says, and the earth opened up its mouth and swallowed them up into the flames. Okay, so they literally saw them swallowed up into flames. So those guys are not come out, come out and go to purgatory and get a second chance and then go to heaven. They in hell, you know. When Jesus told the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, it wasn't a parable. Because every time says, and Jesus spoke to them in a parable. Jesus spoke to them in a parable. But when it comes to Lazarus and the rich man, Jesus says, there was a rich man. And there was a man called Lazarus. He didn't say parable. Parable is a story. But Jesus said, there was a man. There was a man. And the one man was carried out and laid at the gate. And the other one died and was taken. And the other one died and was taken. So Jesus tells a story that was there. And he says, and the one guy cried out and said, Father Abraham, can't you send Lazarus just to bring some water and put it on the tip of my tongue? He says, there's a great divide between the two of us that one can't go over from this side to this side. So when Jesus died, he took prisoners captive, those that were on the other side, okay? And he led them in a, in a victory march. So there had to be a cloud to receive Jesus, okay? It's touching on different things. But... Uh, when, when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration and Moses and Elijah appeared, which represents the law and the prophets, and the voice said, this is my son, and when the cloud disappeared and Moses and Elijah was gone, it was Jesus only. But there first came a, a, a cloud over, and out of the cloud walked Moses and Elijah. Cloud disappeared, gone is Moses and Elijah. Okay, so in Acts chapter 1 verse 13, he says, uh, and a cloud received him out of their sight. But in Matthew 27, sorry, I'm just touching on the scriptures. Matthew 27 says, when Jesus died, the graves of the righteous opened. Not the graves opened. The graves of the righteous opened. And they did not come out till after his resurrection. And they appeared in the city for 40 days. Now you must know, it's not only Jesus that appeared. So we don't have reference of all this stuff. But all the saints the right, appeared in Jerusalem. What 40 days must that have been? I mean, nobody talks about that stuff, but it's still in the Bible. So they all appear. Imagine, here's Abram, and Isaac, and Jacob, and David, and Jephthah. And they're all appearing in the streets of Jerusalem. I mean, that's why Jesus said this generation, that generation must have had a curse on them because they didn't believe, you know. So all those righteous people believed, but they, they didn't walk around, they appeared. So they were somewhere. Where were they? Heaven. You know, because Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. So Paul says, I was caught up, I was caught up into paradise. 
Okay, so paradise is not in the earth anymore like it was in the Old Testament. Paradise is now up. Now up is not in the distance. Up means higher level. So it's around us. But it's called, so Hebrews chapter 12 says, seeing that we are surrounded with so great cloud of witnesses. So when Jesus uh, uh, ascended, doesn't mean he, shh, oh, there goes Jesus, there goes, no. He said, I am from above. You know? And then he says to Nicodemus, if the son of man that comes down from heaven goes back to heaven, which is in heaven. And then Jesus said, if I go back to where I was before, See, it's all scriptures about talking about a higher level. So when Jesus had to go away, you know, and he's in the one the Mount of Olives, and the Bible says, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So there appeared a cloud. What is the cloud? Cloud of witnesses, Hebrews chapter 12. So it's all those righteous saints that are now in the cloud. So a cloud received him. So here comes the cloud, the cloud of witnesses received him. And there stood two men with him. Not two angels. Two men, because in Matthew 17 it says, they spoke about his exit that should take place outside Jerusalem. Okay, so here's the two men again. Say, this is just what we said. He just exited. Was it too much? Okay. Okay, so the cloud had to receive Jesus out of their sight. Okay, so... Uh, uh, the rich man and Lazarus, the fact that there was a, div a divide between the two groups, but the other group is not there anymore. It's now paradise. It's now in a higher level. It's now called cloud of witnesses. But the other group is still there. Nothing happened to them. They just heard that they messed it up and, and they, uh, they're still burning. And he says, it's a flame that can never be quenched. So hell is a reality. Otherwise, we just tear the book of Revelation. I spoke about uh, Revelation the other night, and we came to chapter 1. People just looked at me, and I just tore the page out of my Bible and crumbled it up and threw it away. I said, why do we keep it in the Bible if we don't believe it? Let's keep what we believe. Huh? Just one thing about that. Uh, obviously, there's two main words there in the Old Testament and New Testament concerning hell, which is Sheol and Hades. And... Uh, so, what some people are doing is they're manipulating the idea of the word hell is an English word which has been substituted in for those words. And so I think you could technically say the word hell is not in the Bible. But the idea of what it's representing is in the Bible. And so whether it's this word or that word, it's almost meaningless. What matters is the fact that there's a place of absolute abandonment from the presence of God. And I, I, when people say, we're in hell right now, you know, well, they don't realize the effect Christianity has had upon the whole planet has liberated people, believers and unbelievers, uh, from many atrocities. The whole world has come out of darkness in such radical ways that, um, in fact, the scripture even says, you know, the, uh, the darkness has begun to flee away and the true light has, be has already begun to shine. So there's been a shining going on for so long. If we were taken back now, back to that day, you'd be horrified at the condition and the estate of man, both mentally and spiritually. Uh, the, the rise that we've gone through. So when you look at where people are today, um, um, I like to consider like First John uh, chapter 1, verse 5, where it says, you know, this is the message which we have heard from him and declare unto you that God is light. And in him is no darkness at all. And it goes on there a little while later and says, you know, um, if we say, I have fellowship with God and hate our brother, well, it actually says, if we walk in darkness. But then you go over the next chapter, verse 9, and it says, he who walks in darkness hates his brother until now. So I just substitute that in there and say, if I say, I have fellowship with God, and I hate my brother, I lie and don't practice the truth. And so um, if I can have darkness in me, and God, there's no darkness in God at all, what chance will I have to stand in his glory? You know, uh, how are we going to include the whole world in darkness into the presence of light of our God? Uh, what God does, he doesn't, um, he doesn't put on some glasses and change your figure of what you really are inside. He's not deceiving himself. He doesn't have the rosy Jesus glasses on. He comes in and transfers his nature into your nature, takes darkness out of you and puts light into you. And when that massive transformation takes place, you don't hate your brother. 
because you've been delivered from the darkness. And so there's a fitness that we are in that will not find itself in a place of outer darkness. It cannot happen to us. But to those who are in darkness, where else can they go but far from the presence of God? Yeah. Yeah, so that's why the Revelation 21 thing and Isaiah 60, uh, Arise, shine, your light has come. And the, the kings of this world will come to the rising of your light. They will come to you. That's why your gates can't be shut by day or by night. You must always be there to receive them and tell them and shine the light upon them. Right. Question. Um, just on the cloud of witnesses, I um, would just like to know your opinion on, on how much you think that they are designed to interact with us, um, how much they are involved in what's happening right here on earth right now. And, um, and what that looks like as heaven comes down to earth. Okay, so the Bible says we shall not consult the spirits of the dead. So we don't talk to them and say, oh, John G. Lake, you know, what did you do here? We consult God and we are led by the Spirit of God. But the cloud of witnesses is such a reality. You know, uh, uh, since the New Testament, since paradise has been taken out, and since the cloud of witnesses, remember he Hebrews 11 says, they without us could not be made perfect. But now chapter 12 says, verse 22 through 24, we have come to Mount Zion. We have come to the city of God. We have come to the New Jerusalem. We have come to the innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of the saints made perfect. So we have come to them. So they are around us. You know, chapter 12, verse 1, seeing that we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and that sin that so easily beset us and let's keep our eyes on Jesus who for the price that was set before him endured the price of the cross. So we don't look at the cloud, we keep looking at Jesus. Uh, I ministered in a town called Rustenburg, uh, our school principal. He just came here out of a Dutch Reformed church. So he has got no idea of charismatics, Pentecostals, tongue-talking, saints, nothing. He just know the Almighty God. They don't even know Jesus, they just know the Almighty God, you know, the Almighty God. And... Uh, 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 so he was going to become our school principal, but he first came as a teacher. And uh, uh, so we went to preach in Rustenburg, and I said to him and his wife, why don't you just go with us? So I'm ministering there, and I'm ministering on power of God and glory of God. And he comes to me and he said, uh, there was a man next to you while you were preaching. I said, oh yeah? He says, uh, yeah, his name is George Jeffries. And I said, George Jeffries, yeah, there was such a man uh, in the 1911s. He said, how did I know his name? You know, look at me, I come from a Dutch Reformed church. And I said, will you recognize him? He says, yes, I'll see him immediately. You know, if I, so I went to my office when we came back and I took a book where I have all these heroes of faith in and I said, uh, Okay, and I took a photo of the two Jeffrey brothers, Steve and George Jeffries, you know, and I showed them. He said, that's the one with the dark hair. I said, yeah, he was a great evangelist. I said, and Reinhard Bonker picked up his mantle, you know, and this, he said, wow, that's strange. He said, but when you were start ministering to the sick, there was another man with you, but he was a short guy, and uh, he was like uh, talking very low, like he was saying something like, uh, I greet you now in the name of Jesus, uh, dear sister, I would like, he said, I said, yeah, that's William Branham. He says, yeah, because he looked at the people and he stood back and he said, I uh, just want to pick up your spirit for a minute, you know. Now, this guy knows nothing. So I showed him the photo. He said, that's him. Man, and then God reminded me of a vision that I shared with Reinhard Bonker, and then Reinhard Bonker wrote a book about it. Uh, in, when Reinhard Bonker went to Bible school from Germany to England, he couldn't speak a word of English. So he went to English Bible school, uh, primarily for preaching the gospel, but secondarily to learn English. So they didn't want to accept him in the Bible school because he couldn't speak English. But he said, I will learn English. So he, he learned, But before he went to Bible school, him and his dad used to talk about George Jeffries. Man, that was an evangelist in England. This guy could rock the world. And when he finished the three years in Bible school, 
you know, he had to wait about four or five hours for his train to go back to Germany. Uh, so he was just walking around there in London waiting for the train. And all of a sudden he had the urge. He said he just felt like, man, I wonder if George Jeffrey stayed in this area. And he just, and all of a sudden he saw a little board on a gate, George Jeffries, but the paint was off. And he thought by himself, yeah, I wonder if this was the George Jeffries that used to be the evangelist. You know, it's just thoughts, thoughts. So he said, and the gate was real squeaky, and he opened it up, and it was the garden was full of weeds, and you know, it's not really anything going on. He said, and he walked up to the, to the door, you know, knocked on the door. He said, now, old lady, open up. And he said, uh, is this the house where the former evangelist uh, George Jeffries used to stay? And the woman said, I think you should just go away, young man. He said, and a voice came from outside, inside, you know, let the young man in. He said, and he opened up and there was this wheelchair. And here was this very old man sitting, very pale, very skinny, you know, in the wheelchair. And he said, I've been waiting for you all day, young man. He says, I am George Jeffries. He says, uh, come, I want to pray for you. Reinhard Bonk said, man, he started weeping. And here's George Jeffries. He said, laid hands on him. He said, God, this young man will shake Africa. He will take Africa for Jesus. Prophesied over him. He said, got on the train. He said, but he was weeping all the way. Got home, you know, slept through the night. And early in the morning, his dad woke him up with a cup of coffee. And he said, hey, son. Uh, you got to see the morning newspaper. There's, uh, in the smalls, there's this little thing that, remember the guy we used to talk about, George Jeffries? Now, he didn't have time to talk to you. He said, the man passed away during the night. And the small said, former evangelist passed away in his sleep last night. You know? So he said, there he walked away. And then I said to him, he told me the story. And I said to him, hey, but what are you walking around with? I mean, that guy is there walking with you. So when you preach, he is ministering with you. So I'm just telling the stories to confirm what I say in the Bible, that the cloud, we don't talk to them, but they can manifest and we can, they can minister with us. We've seen it. Uh, during the course of last year when I was so sick, I came back to the church one day and I was just starting to preach on, on the pulpit. And uh, all of a sudden I became aware, not just the anointing, but there's something else on the stage, you know? And I saw some faces in the church that looked funny, you know, like, you know, they all looked past me. And we looked to the one corner, and there was Smith Wiggles was standing with a long coat, and he was smiling, you know, and he said, uh, just like I prophesied, just like I prophesied. And, you know. Right, question. Um, just on the cloud of witnesses, I um, would just like to know your opinion on, on how much you think that they are designed to interact with us, um, how much they are involved in what's happening right here on earth right now, and, um, and what that looks like as heaven comes down to earth. Okay, so the Bible says we shall not consult the spirits of the dead. So we don't talk to them and say, oh, John G. Lake, you know, what did you do here? We consult God and we are led by the Spirit of God. But the cloud of witnesses is such a reality. You know, uh, uh, since the New Testament, since paradise has been taken out and since the cloud of witnesses, remember Hebrews 11 says, they without us could not be made perfect. But now chapter 12 says, verse 22 through 24, we have come to 
Mount Zion. We have come to the city of God. We have come to the new Jerusalem. We have come to the innumerable company of angels and to the spirits of the saints made perfect. So we have come to them. So they are around us. You know, chapter 12, verse 1, seeing that we are surrounded with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and that sin that so easily beset us and let's keep our eyes on Jesus who for the price that was set before him endured the price of the cross. So we don't look at the cloud, we keep looking at Jesus. You see, and if we start looking at cloud, we start looking at saints and we become Roman Catholics. Okay, then we have, we pray to this saint and we pray to that saint. But that doesn't say the saints can't come to our aid. All right, uh, uh, I've ministered just a few testimonies. So uh, I ministered in a town called Rustenburg, uh, our school principal. He just came here out of a Dutch Reformed church. So he has got no idea of charismatics, Pentecostals, tongue-talking, saints, nothing. He just know the Almighty God. They don't even know Jesus. They just know the Almighty God, you know, the Almighty God. And uh, 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 so he was going to become our school principal, but he first came as a teacher. And... Uh, uh, so we went to preach in Rustenburg, and I said to him and his wife, why don't you just go with us? So I'm ministering there, and I'm ministering on power of God and glory of God. And he comes to me and he said, uh, there was a man next to you while you were preaching. I said, oh yeah? He says, uh, yeah, his name is George Jeffries. And I said, George Jeffries? Yeah, there was such a man uh, in the 1911s. He said, how did I know his name? You know? Look at me, I come from a Dutch Reformed church. And I said, will you recognize him? He says, yes, I'll see him immediately. You know, if I, so I went to my office when we came back, and I took a book where I have all these heroes of faith in, and I said, uh, okay, and I took a photo of the two Jeffrey brothers, Steve and George Jeffries, you know, and I showed them. He said, that's the one with the dark hair. I said, yeah, he was a great evangelist. I said, and Reinhard Bonker picked up his mantle, you know. And this, he said, Oh, that's strange. He said, but when you were start ministering to the sick, there was another man with you, but he was a short guy. And uh, he was like uh, talking very low, like he was saying something like, uh, I greet you now in the name of Jesus, uh, dear sister, I would like, he said, I said, yeah, that's William Branham. He says, yeah, because he looked at the people and he stood back and he said, I... Uh, just want to pick up your spirit for a minute, you know. Now, this guy knows nothing. So I showed him the photo. He said, that's him. Man, and then God reminded me of a vision that I shared with Reinhard Bonker, and then Reinhard Bonker wrote a book about it. Uh, in, when Reinhard Bonker went to Bible school from Germany to England, he couldn't speak a word of English. So he went to English Bible school, uh, primarily for preaching the gospel, but secondarily to learn English. So they didn't want to accept him in the Bible school because he couldn't speak English. But he said, I will learn English. So he, he learned, but before he went to Bible school, him and his dad used to talk about George Jeffries. Man, that was an evangelist in England. This guy could rock the world. And when he finished the three years in Bible school, you know, he had to wait about four or five hours for his train to go back to Germany. Uh, so he was just walking around there in London waiting for the train. And all of a sudden he had the urge. He said he just felt like, man, I wonder if George Jeffrey stayed in this area. And he just, and all of a sudden he saw a little board on a gate, George Jeffries, but the paint was off. And he thought by himself, yeah, I wonder if this was the George Jeffries that used to be the evangelist. You know, it's just thoughts, thoughts. So he said, and the gate was real squeaky, and he opened it up, and it was the garden was full of weeds, and you know, it's not really anything going on. He said, and he walked up to the, to the door, you know, knocked on the door. He said, now, old lady, open up. And he said, uh, is this the house where the former evangelist, uh, George Jeffries, used to stay? And the woman said, I think you should just go away, young man. He said, and a voice came from outside, inside, you know, let the young man in. He said, open up, and there was this wheelchair, and here was this very old man sitting, very pale, very skinny, you know, in the wheelchair. And he said, I've been waiting for you all day, young man. He says, I am George Jeffries. 
he says, uh, come, I want to pray for you. Reinhard Bonk said, man, he started weeping. And here's George Jeffries. He said, laid hands on him. He said, God, this young man will shake Africa. He will take Africa for Jesus. Prophesied over him. He said, got on the train. He said, but he was weeping all the way. Got home, you know, slept through the night. And early in the morning, his dad woke him up with a cup of coffee. And he said, hey, son. Uh, you got to see the morning newspaper. There's, uh, in the smalls, there's this little thing that, remember the guy we used to talk about, George Jeffries? Now, he didn't have time to talk to you. He said, the man passed away during the night. And the small said, former evangelist passed away in his sleep last night. You know? So he said, there he walked away. And then I said to him, he told me the story. And I said to him, hey, but what are you walking around with? I mean, that guy is there walking with you. So when you preach, he is ministering with you. So I'm just telling the stories to confirm what I say in the Bible, that the cloud, we don't talk to them, but they can manifest and we can, they can minister with us. We've seen it. Uh, during the course of last year when I was so sick, I came back to the church one day and I was just starting to preach on, on the pulpit. And uh, all of a sudden I became aware, not just the anointing, but there's something else on the stage, you know? And I saw some faces in the church, they look funny, you know, like, you know, they all looked past me. And we looked to the one corner, and there was Smith Wiggles was standing with a long coat, and he was smiling, you know, and he said, uh, just like I prophesied, just like I prophesied. And, you know, and then right behind me was A.A. A. Allen jumping up and down. He said, come on, Jesus, come on, Jesus, you're not going to fail us, Jesus, you're not going to fail us, Jesus. And a lot of people saw it. Same time. And then in our old church, I was preaching one night and uh, uh, just preaching. And then everybody looked up, you know, not everybody, but we, we count to say about 60 people when we raised our hands. We saw something moving from one side to the other. And I looked and I felt this presence and I looked around and I saw John G. Lake. But he was like, like it looked like he was eating cheese. Now, don't ask me why. <laughs> But I'll tell you now the, 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 the significance of it. The 65 people that saw it all said he was moving from one side to the other side and he was busy eating cheese. All said the same thing. Now, how would you know he's eating cheese? You know, I don't know if they eat cheese in heaven, but this is what we saw. And we felt it. So many times when I speak, now we don't make doctrines of it to become, we're going to, adore the saints, but we are aware that the cloud of witnesses is there. They are, uh, remember Ephesians chapter 3, the whole family in heaven and on earth. So there's the whole family in heaven and on earth. There is the saints, and many times the saints talk about those that is in heaven and the other saints, those that are on earth. So uh, there was a great evangelist in South Africa and he had a big ministry in the uh, uh, West Rand of uh, Johannesburg. And uh, this whole ministry, a lot of dreams that I dreamed about him, how I was going to die and stuff like that happened. But his, his, his youngest son wanted to have his 21st birthday in our church. Now, I didn't know about it. But it was just a wish that he spoke out. Now, he toured with his dad the last three years of his dad's life. So his dad died in a car accident when he was 17 or something like that. And then one day I just had the urge to phone the guy. Never met him, never known him. So I uh, got his telephone number, phoned him and said, Jacques, would you come minister at our place? He said, oh, it's my dream to minister in your church. So uh, he came and he said to me, Do you know what? I'm turning 21 in this week. And I always wanted to have my 21st birthday in your church. That was a desire. And the first night he got up to speak. Now his dad was very tall and he, you know, he's a big athlete. So he's standing like this, you know, like all his photos were normally like this, his action photos. And while he was preaching, I looked up and I saw his dad like that. And he speaks exactly like his dad, you know. Uh, my brothers, uh, tonight, uh, I want to talk to you uh, about the greatness of our God. You know, and, and I looked up, and the glory of God fell in the house, the exact same anointing. Afterwards, I said, Jock, did you feel anything? He said, I felt my dad with me all night long. Now, I have ministered where I speak, and, I, and my wife said, you know, you spoke like that guy. I said, but I felt him with me all night. 
And sometimes when I minister, I feel different guys walking around with me. So they are here. Yeah. You know? So we must be aware that if we don't believe it, they will be there. But if we believe it, they will be here. Because we are surrounded with a cloud of witnesses. Uh, the one translation says, the grand stands around us in which we run our race is screaming at us from heaven. You know, so uh, they are screaming at us, cheering at us. So uh, you can make it. You can make it. So they looked for something. We got that something. Okay, what last testimony. I'm just telling you testimonies to confirm Ephesians 4, Hebrews 12. Uh, me and Kubis, Johan and Petrus, my three sons. So I'm very sick now. Not now, I mean the testimony. So I can't really walk. So they helped me. And I said, I just want to sit close to the pool tonight because there's so many miracles that happened there, you know. So I sat down with my back hands wall. I said, come on, you guys. Come and sit with me. Just come pray with Dad. And I said, oh, just come pray with me. I was a sick man. Please just come pray with me. And I struggle not to weep. So all three of them sit and they all hold my hands. So we just sit there. And Elise is walking around here. It's Friday night, late here, close to 12 o'clock. We're all praying. Now that wall, that whole wall was full of uh, pictures of the cloud of witnesses. Branham, you saw it. Branham, Wigglesworth, Lake, all those guys. Big photos. Pencil sketches that a girl made, but so good. And so sitting there, and all of a sudden, we heard voices. All three of, or four of us, the three of them and me. Voices, but many voices. I said, shh, do you hear it? We hear it. It's just here above the pool. And then I was caught up in the spirit. And God said, listen how they pray. And I could actually heard Finney going around the city with his horse. And he says, I take authority over the city. Every spirit of darkness I bind, I take authority, I release it. I could hear it. <laughs> I could hear his voice. And I'm sure that that, that was Charles Finney praying, he said. And I take authority. Every knee shall bow as I enter the city. I take authority. <sighs> and I heard A.A. Allen. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. Jesus tonight. Jesus. Jesus. Just come walk in that tent. Jesus. And I hear. I said to them, yeah. God says, they are praying with you. Yeah. It's not you praying with them. They are praying with you. Now, remember, we make intercession for the saints, but we also make intercession with the saints. All right? So, and that's where the Catholics got their doctrines from, from praying to the saints, but we don't pray to the saints. And God says, all of them are gone, so they could not be made perfect with us. But we have now come to the spirits of the saints made perfect. So they wanted something. We got that something. So they're still praying for that something. Oh God, there's Kubis there in Stilfontaine. You know, and they pray to the revivals that I needed. You know, would you give it? So if I intercede accordingly, they join with me in prayer. So God says, just be aware that when you pray and you get in the right spirit, there's people that prayed for the thing you're praying for. They got portions of it. They didn't get the full measure. So they're joining us in prayer. So they are a reality. Yeah. But we don't pray to them. They pray with us. And they can manifest. But not that we give attention to them. Remember, we look unto Jesus. So we can be distracted. And the Amplified Bible would say in verse 2 of Hebrews 12, look away from all that will distract by looking unto Jesus. So the cloud can distract you. You can become aware. Oh, Branham is in the house. Oh, Wigglesworth is in the house. Uh, uh, that's a minor thing. We are here. Yeah. Even angels are minor. Yeah. They are servants to us. So when we see angels at different occasions, we don't go and write a book about it. We don't make a DVD about it. We just wait. Oh, there were seven angels standing here, you know, uh, like last year as well. You know, I ministered a lot on angels two years ago. And last year, a couple of times, standing in the front, you know, something bumping me, bumping me. And I look, and there's angels around me, you know. And I saw angels on the stage. But we don't write a book about it because the major thing is we need to be the people that will shake the world with the power of gospel of Jesus Christ. And angels are our servants to the Amplified Bible, say, to come to the aid 
of those who are to be heirs of salvation. So there are servants in the cloud of witnesses. He's just there to confirm what we are doing, but it's our time. The only thing, um, remember in Kings, it says that King Saul went to consult a medium. Yeah, and then to call up Samuel, who had died. So if you go and do that, just remember the prophecy Samuel gave to him brought about his destruction. So I, I don't want to consult no. and seek the dead because I, uh, you know, those who preceded us because it brought destruction. Yeah. But it's, it's doubtless on the Mount of Transfiguration that those guys turned up. Yeah. And then the scripture also says, he is the God of the living, not of the dead. Yeah. And so all those who have gone before us, they are living, they are not dead. Yeah. 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 Goody. Good show. Yeah. Um. So you have been many, many years in the office of a prophet, and my question is if there's anything that you would like to share with, with people who feel called to this office, and like, especially like, any advice, any, like, anything that you just would like to share. Uh, I say to people, my name is Kubis. I stand in the office of a prophet. So you can call me Kubis, you can call me brother Kubis, you can call me uncle Kubis, you can call me prophet. That doesn't make me a prophet, yeah. you see. Out of respect, people would say prophet, but if they say brother, I feel the same respect. If they say Kuba, the same. But the office of a prophet and the gift of prophecy. Uh, if we go to the Bible, oh, I can't preach every question, but 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, When that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away with. What is the perfect? Love. So if we are perfected in love, we don't need the partial. What is the partial? Okay, It's a gift of a word of wisdom. A gift of a word of knowledge. A gift of prophecy. You know, it's all past portions. You know, parcels, little gifts. It's not a full measure. Okay? So, this is where I differ from the rest of the church. Right? So, Jesus has a prophecy in Isaiah chapter 11. On him the spirit of the Lord shall rest. The spirit of wisdom. The spirit of knowledge. The spirit of counsel. The spirit of the Lord. Okay? So Jesus comes in John 3.34 and it says, uh, he's, God gives him the spirit not with measure because he speaks the word of God. So Jesus comes not with the measure of the Spirit. Jesus does not minister the gift of healing. Jesus does not minister the gift of a word of wisdom. Jesus does not minister the gift of a word of knowledge. He ministers wisdom, knowledge, counsel. He comes out of the desert, baptized by John, and says, The Spirit of the Lord is now upon me, for he has now anointed me to preach the gospel. So Jesus doesn't need a word of knowledge. Jesus has, they say, you, have, you know all things about all men, says the Pharisees to him. So Jesus don't need a gift. He's got the spirit of the Lord upon him. Okay, so here comes Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah says to Elisha, what is it you want? You know, he says, a double portion of your spirit. So Elijah's gone. Here's Elisha, and uh, the sons of the prophet says, Behold, the spirit of Elijah does now rest upon Elisha. Okay, so what did he get? A double portion. So we preach on it. If we count the miracles of Elijah and we count the miracles of Elisha, it was exactly double the amount of miracles. So is that what you want? Do you want to walk away and say, I had 23 miracles in my lifetime. I had 15 <laughs> miracles in my So, oh. I want what Wigglesworth had. I want what John G. Lake had. No, brother, we get uh, character traits out of their spiritual lives. Stuff that they had can be now with us because we read their life stories. We associate it with their spirits. So stuff that they had, I get. So that's why sometimes you act like your father, like your mother, because there's certain stuff that you know that you like. The things that you don't like, 1 Peter 1 verse 18, we have been redeemed from all the useless, fruitless way of living that we could have inherited from our forefathers by the blood of Jesus. So we don't take that stuff, though there's no generational curses, there's no bloodline curses. The blood of Jesus has made me free from all that curses. Okay? So I take people to the cross and you're free. But the good stuff I can have. Hmm? 
Okay, so where are we? Okay, the gifts. Okay, so Jesus comes and he's got the immeasurable spirit. He hasn't got a portion of the spirit. Okay, so people go, oh, I want a gift of prophecy. I want a gift of that. I want a gift of that. Okay? So Jesus now ascends. Ephesians chapter 4. When he ascended, what is it that the first descended into the lower parts of the earth? When he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. Okay, what gifts did he give unto men? Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. What for? To equip the saints. So for the perfecting of the for the perfecting of the ministry, till we all come to the unity of the faith, to the stature of the fullness of the Christ. So what is the apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers therefore to equip saints till we all come to the measure of Christ? What is the measure of Christ? He gave gifts unto his measure. What is his measure? Immeasurable. So he hasn't got a measure of the Spirit. So let us go on to perfection. Hebrews chapter 6. What is perfection? 1 Corinthians 13. When that which is perfect is come. Now 13 is squeezed in between 12 and 14. 12 and 14 talks about the gifts. 13 talks about the perfection. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I get a little word of knowledge. Brother, I see, you, uh, uh, I see your name is Jack. Oh, wow, wow, he said my name is Jack, wow, wow. It's just a word, you know. Oh, uh, brother, I see uh, God says he's going to raise you up as a prophet. Keep on, keep on. No, that's all that God is saying to me, okay? So it's a word. It's a word of prophecy, a word of knowledge. But what if we become prophets? What if we walk around as mature men and women of God? Then we prophesy all day long. So what makes a prophet? Genesis. Uh, Abram says, it's my sister. Right? There's a good one for uh, AIDS renewal. You know, you don't get a baby at 90 and no sheik desires a woman of 90 to be in his harem. So Sarah became younger. She's now taken into the king's harem. And uh, she must have been there for a long time because it's in the course of time the family of that guy started getting sick. And God says to the king, take your wife to Abram. He will pray for her that she will be healed because, she is, because he is a prophet. Okay? So the first time we hear a prophet is go let him be healed because he's a prophet. Okay? So when Jesus comes around, what made them call him prophet? Is this not the prophet? Not the fact that he prophesied. You know? He only said to uh, Nathaniel, I saw you under the tree and to the woman you had five husbands. That's all. Okay? But they said, is this not the prophet? When did they call him prophet? They said, when Messiah comes, will he do more miracles? All these healings, is this not the prophet? Okay? So a prophet need to have miracles. A prophet need to have signs and wonders. Then what is a true prophet? A true prophet takes a person to the word of God. And Paul and Barnabas... Acts chapter 13. They were certain prophets. Okay? So what did the prophets do? They declared the word of the Lord to the people. In other words, they said, it is written. Look here, people. There it is written in Habakkuk chapter 1. Behold, I will do a work in your days. You know? That's Acts chapter 13. You want to know a prophet? Acts chapter 13. There were certain prophets. And they laid hands on them after they fasted and prayed and sent them out. And then they came to that island and there Sergius Paulus, the governor of the island, he wanted to hear the word of the Lord from the prophets. And there was a sorcerer. And Paul says, you know, uh, you shall be blind, you know, because you are resisting. The guy is blind. And the Bible says, and when the governor heard the word of the Lord, what did Paul say? You shall be blind. And then he started declaring the word of the Lord. You know? And then uh, he first preached on Jesus being incorruptible, how David prophesied. I said, now this man, Jesus, you've got to hear this because I don't think there's anybody that really teaches this stuff that I'm saying now. Okay? He says, uh, 
This, by this man is preached unto you now. The forgiveness of sins. Okay? Not the repentance of sins. The forgiveness of sins. By this man is preaching. There's a good word for the grace people. By this man is preached unto you forgiveness of sins. He didn't say the repentance from sin. By this man is preached the forgiveness of sin. So we need to teach people that their sins are forgiven. Prophet. Okay? Then he says, it is written. Okay? So here's the prophets. It is written. I will do a work in your days that if somebody preach it unto you, it will be a struggle to believe it even if they explain it, says the Amplified Bible. Okay? So that you are now justified from everything that the law of Moses could not justify you. Prophet, you are now justified from everything that the law of Moses could not justify you. So that is Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 3. There is therefore now no condemnation. Because what did Jesus do with the spirit of life, which is in Christ, has made us free from the law of sin and death? Because what did he do? He freed us from everything that the law of Moses could not free us. Okay, so sin and death was there because of the law. We are justified from the law. And now we've got to go find out what was written. So we go to Habakkuk, chapter 1. Uh, we, I'm going to do a work in your days that if you hear it, you will struggle to believe it. What is the work? Chapter 12, uh, verse 12. Oh God, you are from everlasting and we shall not die. Chapter 2. Write down the vision and run with it. It'll tarry. But at the end, it shall speak. Okay? Chapter 3. O oh God, revive thy work. Please, in wrath, would you remember mercy? Okay? Then he talks about the hiding place of his power, the horns in his hand. Okay? He said, and I saw horns in his hand, which is the secret place of his power. Revelation chapter 4 and 5. And I saw a lamb with seven horns. In other words, he's got the manifold wisdom of the anointing of the Holy Spirit, horns for anointing. So what did Habakkuk saw? When we pray for that true revival, where the fullness will be restored, where life will be preached, Jesus is going to measure. He said, that's the seven spirits of God. Jesus is ready to anoint us with his measure, which is immeasurable, so then we don't have gifts, then we don't worry about offices. We just do what we do to train the saints. And when we all come to the unity of the faith, there's no prophets, there's no pastors, there's no apostles, there's no evangelists. We're all Christ-like. So what is creation waiting for? You heard it. The manifestation of the sons. What's are, what are the sons? You are the son. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So that's where we're heading for. That's got to be our aim. Maturity, perfection, which is no gifts but the fullness. The gifts is apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Not speaking in tongues, uh, gift of prophecy, gift of word of knowledge. That is portions of gifts that Paul says, when we are perfect, that will pass away. So I'd rather have the spirit of wisdom than the word of wisdom. I'd rather have the spirit of knowledge than the word of wisdom, knowledge. I'd rather heal the sick than have a gift of healing. You see, now people come to me and say, oh, uh, this one woman, you're a prophet. Why don't you just prophesy over us more? I say, I do all the time. And this is what happened. The morning the woman passed me by, we just passed each other by. Phew, and I said to her, uh, you mustn't take that daughter of yours to that doctor you want to take her to. She said, no, I also thought I shouldn't. The afternoon she said, why don't you prophesy over us more? I said, what's your daughter doing? 
She says, oh, she's got a, a problem with her mind. She get these epileptic fits. I said, oh, are you going to take her to a doctor? She said, yes, we made an appointment for this afternoon. I said, oh, did I say something to you this morning that you shouldn't take your daughter to the doctor? Yes. And then I realized I'm walking around like that prophesying all the time. I come to people and slap them and said, uh, that thing from Joburg will arrive tomorrow. Yes, thank you. They don't even realize that they're waiting for a parcel from Johannesburg and I just said to them, it will come tomorrow. You know? So in our preaching, it's prophetic because the sick are healed, the word is going out, people is coming to perfection. I would take the average guy in our church and put them next to 90% of the preachers in the world and they will out-preach them. Yeah, when they go out, they come back from holiday. They said, we didn't know there's so much word in us. Yo, we were on holiday. We were on the beach, and this guy came, and I just said this to him, and I said that to him, and he asked me a question. I explained that to him. I said, that's it. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the perfecting of the ministry till we all come to the unity of the faith, the measure of the stature of the Christ. So I say, I don't go for gifts, I go for perfection. In our church, we don't preach gifts, we preach perfection. Okay? To the annoyance of some people, because they promote the office so high that everybody needs to bow to them, especially in Africa. If you're a prophet, everybody needs to crawl on their knees to come to you. Oh, prophet, oh, prophet, you know. They come in out, you say, oh, prophet. I said, stand on your feet. You know? I may be standing in the office of a prophet, but we are brothers. Even in the Revelation, when the angel appeared and Jesus appeared, you know, stand on your feet. I'm just a fellow servant in the kingdom of God. Huh? Do you want to say something on that? One scripture comes to mind is uh, Hebrews 1.1. 1, 1, and it says that in latter times, God spoke to the prophets, uh, through the prophets to our fathers. But in these last days, he has spoken unto us through his son. And so there's a message in the sons of the living God. And so it's like our lives are testifying and bearing witness to and demonstrating, prophetically demonstrating the outcome of Christ's work. So, but I would say this about the gifts as well. Um, I find that the higher principle of operating in that prophetic wisdom versus the prophetic gift does not undermine the lesser one. So, yeah. So when, when somebody says, "Ah, I got a word of knowledge," or "I got a word of wisdom," no, it doesn't disregard. That. Yeah, we don't. We don't want to disregard that. We want to praise that and thank God for that because they're hearing the Spirit. They're they're getting a measure. So what we want to do is then urge them to continue on until the measure of the sun starts coming upon them, and then, then the 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 thing becomes strong. Yeah. That is wisdom. <laughs> that is wisdom that's the gift of wisdom okay so uh, when we talk to this it's because you are students you want to go to perfection but when we go out there and preach to the people we must know we don't undermine the lower principle we enjoy it wow this is awesome and it stirs the church but we preach let's go to perfection but we still uh, desire the best gift or do we still go I just think don't write prophetic checks with your mouth that your character can't cash. Yeah. 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 Yeah, fly as wide as your wings are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, two more questions. I was just wondering how you would define mantles and what that looks like because I've heard a lot of different definitions and a lot of different beliefs on that. The cloud and the mantles are exactly the same thing. You know, you read a book and you still, like, uh, we just walked into my office and I showed him some photos there of the cloud of witnesses. He says, you know, uh, I feel more related to John G. Lake than anybody else I said, me too. If I read books, Smith Wigglesworth, awesome, but I've got nothing that stirs me. But if I read John G. Lake, I get stirred. Then I started meeting people that, uh, that like New Smith Wigglesworth that was in his meetings and uh, like John G. Lake's one daughter is still in South Africa, you know, staying in Johannesburg. So coming to meet them, Wigglesworth was a rude man. He had no manners. You know, he would walk into a place burr, 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 and you know, if a sick comes, he would hit them on the cancer and stuff like that. I will not do that. My character is, I, 
I want to serve everybody. I want to, you know, exalt everybody. I want to promote everybody. You know, I want to preach sonship, maturity. You know, then I found John G. Lake, his only desire was to preach maturity. To bring maturity and sonship to the church. So that's maybe why I relate to that. So if we talk about mantles and then John G. Lake and stuff like that. So that is what I feel more related to. You know, because of, and when I find out, I find it's a spirit thing. So uh, uh, our spirits are more connected because he was a mature guy, more gentle, trying to get maturity into the, the other guy was more hard and rough and, you know, I can't relate to that. So that's mantles. I think it comes to a spiritual thing. You can relate to somebody and then you walk like them, talk like them, but you become like Christ. Mm. Short, sweet. One more. Okay, uh, my question is pertaining to your teaching on the destroyer. And um, my question is, why did God create the destroyer? As God, I'm not God. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay, okay. The teaching is uh, Isaiah 54. Uh, I have created the destroyer to destroy but no weapon formed against you shall prosper. So he's there, but it's not for you. Okay? So uh, when we go to uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, we can see that it was a man, it was a king. It wasn't referring to an angel or because the previous chapter talks about the, the garden and Eden and the trees. So we got to read, and he burned in the street and his ashes was thrown and people walked on his ashes. So it can't be Satan, it can't be the devil. You know? So the... When man came on the earth in Genesis chapter 2 and chapter 3, Satan was already there. Yes. Okay? So, uh, not the belief, I proved out of the Bible, you can get the series of DVDs that uh, Satan was created amongst the animal kingdom. Man was created in God's rest for God's power and God's glory. So there's a total different creation. So the devil came, the serpent came, and the revelation says the serpent, the dragon, the devil called Satan. It's the same guy, but he was created before man was created. So God comes to Moses in Deuteronomy 31 and 32. Moses prophesying the creation, uh, the, the cross of Christ, the sword that will awake of Genesis chapter 3, Ezekiel 13. Awake, O sword, and slay the shepherd. Matthew 26, this night the prophecy will be fulfilled. Awake, O sword. So Moses prophesied in Deuteronomy 31 and 32. It says, Behold, God says, I create evil, I create good. I create death, I create life. Then Deuteronomy 30 starts off with, Choose life. I hold before you the things that I've created. Good, evil, death, life, Blessing, cursing. Choose. Wow. Okay? So the, create, uh, the destroyer has been created by God. Why did God create him? That is God being God. <laughs> There's no way I can answer why would God. I can reason again, but then I'll be a Pharisee. Because I can't reason. Mm. <laughs> I can't reason that, but God created him. He didn't. He wasn't an angel that fell. That is clear out of those two scriptures. He wasn't an angel that fell. Uh, and people would take the scripture, but I saw Satan fall from heaven, and they would take Revelation 12, that uh, he was cast out, the accuser was cast out, and his place was found in heaven no more. That's very easy to explain, because in Job chapter 1, the Bible says, when the sons of God presented themselves to God. Now the question is, who's the sons of God? Now the old traditional rapture type of doctrine would explain the sons of God as angels. But if I go to Hebrews 1, never did God at any time say to an angel, you are my son. So angels are not sons. Point number one. So who's the sons? It must be the generation of Seth that was destroyed when the flood came and there was no more called sons of God. So the sons of God was the people that still lived in, if we can call it mantles, in the mantle of Seth. Okay? So they were still the generation of sons of God. Sinless people. But then God said, all have now become sinners. Every man is now evil. Okay? So God says, there's no more, there's no more sons of God. Okay? So, but Job, with the understanding of theologians, being the oldest book in the Bible, so it was written in that time. 
before the flood. So Job must have been written before the flood. But how would people know to write that? How would Moses to write Genesis? How would Moses know how to write Genesis, you know? Because uh, in a vision of prophecy, it can be backwards, forwards, anytime. So it says, the sons of God presented themselves to God. And God, as it, and Satan came in amongst them. And God said, where do you come from? In other words, you're not supposed to be among the sons. And he said, from roaming to and throw on the earth. God said, have you noticed my servant Job with this roaming on the earth? So he's not allowed to be in heaven. He's supposed to be on earth. That's where Adam and Eve found him. And then, uh, you know, and he said to God, you know, but this man is hedged about. And chapter 3, here he comes again, you know. And then Job said, what I greatly feared has come upon me. Then Revelation 12, there was this great red dragon. Russia. Come on, no, it's not Russia. <laughs> it's the devil. Uh -huh. Here he comes, and a man-child is born. And he wants to destroy the man-child. Okay, so just keep it in mind. There's the woman, okay, the stars, okay, and uh, uh, let's go quickly to Matthew chapter 2 and Luke chapter 2, okay. They were wise men, okay, from the east, okay, and they came because they saw a star to worship the king. Is that okay? Wise men, not idiots. <laughs> they came from the east. Directly east from uh, 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 Bethlehem is Babylon. Wow. Okay? They saw a star. Balaam, Numbers 24. Balaam, when he repented, he says, he did not go to omens and witchcraft as before, but he turned his face towards the desert. And he said, behold, I see him, but not now. I see a star. Okay? That's the only prophecy about the star in the Bible. I see a star coming. So there's Balaam prophesying the star is coming. Numbers 24. Okay? These wise men came to worship. Okay? The king. So the prophecy is there, behold, your king cometh. Zechariah chapter 9, you know, Isaiah, the king is coming. They come to worship him. Okay, so uh, people from Babylon will definitely not come and follow a star that is prophesied in Jewish writings to come and worship the king of the Jews. Okay, so just quickly. So when, when, when Daniel was taken captive with all the other young men, the wise men from coming from Jerusalem. Remember, it was all about Jerusalem. So they were taken captive to Babylon, and they said, get all the wise men. Okay, and they brought them to the king's court. When the Babylonian captivity was over, the wise men was not taken back to Jerusalem. The Babylonians kept the wise men. Which were the wise men? They were Jews. They were from Israel. It wasn't Babylonian wise men. It was the people that studied the star. They say, we studied and we saw. Okay? So who would study that their star would come? Okay? So they started saying, we saw his, we saw his star. A king is born and we saw his star. So they came to worship the king. Okay? The king said, if you find this, this king, would you tell me that I also can go and worship him? He says, then in the night an angel came and warned Joseph and said, take the child and the woman. Okay? The mother. Luke and Matthew. Take the child and the woman. Flee to Egypt. Just take the... Anyway. Hmm? Till I tell you what will happen. Okay? So, took the child, fled to Egypt. Hmm? He says, I saw, back to Revelation 12, I saw a man child born from a woman. Okay? There's a crown. Okay? And uh, 
there's the sun and the, or whatever. Uh, I'll, I'll get to it now because I'm with this now. Okay, the moon's under her feet. Yeah? And there's a crown over her head and she gives birth to the child. Okay, let's get there. Uh, so, Revelation says, and the dragon wanted to destroy the man child. Okay? And the woman fled into the wilderness. Okay? So the only wilderness that you can flee to from where they were is the great wilderness of Egypt. Okay? So she fled for a space of three and a half years. So for three and a half years, this woman with a child is in Egypt. After three and a half years, the angel came again to Joseph after three and a half years. And the angel said to Joseph, he who wanted to kill the child is now dead. You can now go back. And they returned and they went and stayed in Nazareth. I hope it's not the team. Nazareth. Okay. Nazareth. Okay. Nazareth meaning little village. Nazareth meaning no significance. Okay. Mm -hmm. Revelation. There was a man child. The dragon wanted to destroy it. They fled into the wilderness. After three and a half years, they came back. Mm -hmm. Jesus is born. Wise men came from the east. They saw the star. They came to worship the king. Uh, they saw the star. Going back to just a normal uh, planetarium and turn the time back. So they found 2,013 years ago, Jupiter and Saturnus came together and the one came across the other one and it was the brightest like thing ever eclipse that ever happened in history. Okay? At that time, Regulus, it's a very big star. Uh, Jupiter and Saturnus came and they eclipsed and it was the brightest thing. At that time, Regulus was right over Virgo. Okay? And the moon was right under Virgo. Okay? <laughs> I'm just trying to get this stuff together. At the time... 2013 years ago, you can go check it on the internet, at the birth of Jesus, those two stars came across one another, which is suns. Underneath them was Regulus, which is the biggest star here. Right underneath it was the, the constellation of Virgil. Right underneath it was the moon. Exactly like Revelation says, you got it there. It says in Acts chapter 2, huh. verse 18, and on my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs in the earth beneath. Yeah. This was the wonder that all of Israel was looking at in the sky during the birth of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they still don't understand. So, okay, so everything. Matthew 2, Luke 2, and Revelation chapter 12, and actually it's like everything just folds into one another. So when that happened, okay, when this happened, when this happened, that dragon that was trying to kill the child was cast out of heaven, called the accuser of the brethren who accused them before their God day and night. And his place was found in heaven no more. Okay, you're going to get it. This is the greatest grace message that you've ever heard in your life. Here comes the accuser that accuses them in Job, in Zechariah chapter 3. He's accusing the brethren. Jesus is born. Flee into the wilderness of Egypt. Three and a half years, come back. He who wanted to kill the child is dead. The child, and at that time, when the child flew, 
Satan, the devil, was cast out, the accuser, and his place was found in heaven no more. Here comes Jesus. They bring a woman caught in the act of adultery. Throw, him, throw her in the temple. Say, the law says, kill her. What do you say? Jesus writes in the ground to stand up and say, the, first, the one without uh, sin cast the first stone. They all left. And the, uh, Jesus said to the woman, where is your accuser? She says, no one here. Jesus says, neither do I con." Damn you. In other words, if there's no accusation, there can be no judgment. If there's no judgment, there can be no condemnation. So Jesus said, the day I was born, the accuser was cast out. Now there can't be judgment because the law is taken out of the way. Therefore, there is no condemnation. Jesus came to fulfill all the prophecies. There it is. He can't accuse you. Not here, not there. Romans chapter 8, verses 31. What shall we then say of these things? If God before us, who can be against us? You know, did not spare his own son and gave him up for us all who can now lay any charge who can accuse you huh? you've already been made righteous huh? hmm? who can bring any condemnation upon you Christ is already risen is already at the right hand of God interceding for us so where we had an accuser at the right hand now we have an intercessor at the right hand you can't but make it yeah Jesus wasn't made king after the resurrection. He was born. Where is he that is born king? It had to be for, he was born king. Jesus stands in front of Pilate. Pilate says, so are you then a king? Jesus said, this is why I was born. For this cause I was born. I was born king. No one's going to make me king. That's why the Jews missed it till today. They thought he was going to come and sit on a literal throne of David. And the prophecy is not, oh, that wall is now going to be, that door that's sealed. One day that temple is going to be rebuilt. That wall is going to be broken and Jesus is going to come. In. He already came in on the donkey. Behold, your king comes, Zechariah 9.9. 9. Behold, your king comes riding in on a donkey, lowly. Nazar, no significance. They couldn't see it. Can anything good come from Nazareth? Wow. A little village of no significance. Okay? And, oh, oh yeah, that word Nazar means branch of no significance. Okay? Behold, the branch will come. The man that is called the branch. A branch of no significance from a little village. Okay, so there's all the prophecies. Your king comes, he's lowly, he's got no significance. He's going to be called the branch. Okay, here he comes riding in on a donkey. What does it say? Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. So there's a group that find the prophecy. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, Jesus, stop the children, stop the... He said, if they don't cry out, the rocks will cry out. Okay, rocks will cry out. What happens? Here comes Joshua. They come out of the desert, cross the, the Jordan River, he takes a rock and he says, this rock will witness against you one day. Okay, so where's Jesus coming by? Where the temple was built, what was that? Where Joshua placed the rock, these rocks will one day cry out. Remember, Peter said, uh, prophets prophesied upon whom these days shall come. So Peter wrote stuff that he didn't know. Paul wrote stuff that he didn't know. They wrote stuff in Ephesians and Colossians that were prophecies. That we're only getting now. So people say, oh, they knew it. They didn't know it. They prophesied it. There's many stuff in the New Testament that were prophecies. That's only coming into fulfillment now. You know? So that generation, 70, 80, that generation is gone. Revelation fulfilled. What must happen now? Sons of God must manifest.
I wish I had somebody when I was young to talk to me and when I asked questions to lay hands on me. I had to seek and I had to search. We didn't have this when we were young preachers. We didn't have, I went to America to Kenneth Hagin and, you know, T.L. Osborne and those guys. And in a supernatural way, Lester Sumrall invited me and I stayed with him in the house next door to him. He woke me up in the morning and, you know, I had uh, breakfast with him every morning. He laid hands on me every day prophesied over me. We still got the tape, you know. I was married a few months and he prophesied, oh God, I prophesy my brother. Uh, he said, uh, I, I, uh, I now uh, uh, prophesy uh, over, uh, uh, what's your name again? Kobos, uh, Kobos. Uh, I prophesy over Kobos, yeah. And uh, I prophesy uh, over his, uh, um, his uh, wife there uh, and uh, the, the, three, the three boys. Yes, uh, um, yeah, I see the three boys in ministry. Yes, the house, the house is very important to God. Uh, uh, I, I I pray for you now. You know? mm, okay. That was Lester Sumrall. And then T.L. Osborne invited me to come stay with him. Cancelled all his meetings. Even sent his wife away to go to somebody. And I stayed with him. And for two days he told me his whole life story. And every now and then he would lay his hand, put it on my leg like this. And he said, uh, young man, it's so easy you can miss it. Every now and then. And I said, but if it's so easy, then it means I can make it. And he told me how I went to a Brenner meeting and, uh, you know, he walked out and the Spirit of God said to him, you can do that. You can do that. And he went on to a three-day fast and the third day he woke up and as he walked up, he walked into somebody and Jesus was standing next to his door, next to his bed. And he fell on the floor and Jesus said, you can go back to India now and the power will be with you. You know, and he told me all these stories and laid hands on me and gave me all his tapes and anointed me and said, brother, you're going to go back. He said, your name, and he said it in front of an audience in uh, Leicester Sumrall's church, he said, your name will become a household word in Africa. And at this time, there's not a place in Africa you can't go and talk about Kubis and Redberg. Oh, Kubis, we see him on TV. Oh, Kubis. And they're coming here, you know, just to be healed. So this is what I want to invoke into this prayer cloth and say, take this prayer cloth with you, you know, to carry it with you and say Acts 19, 11, 12. If Paul could have that. And this is one of the greatest parts of our ministry. We have seen dead being raised, not one couple. Of Just take the prayer cloth. Put it on the dead guy, comes alive. You know, uh, miracles. Uh, we try every, every conference, February and September, we print these prayer cloths. So this is what's over and we anoint it and give it to people. Just as a point of contact that uh, we'd ever laid hands on me, I mean, just before uh, Catherine Kuman died, there was a guy in her meeting. She preached one night, he one night, she one night, he one night, and she gave him a cloth. She said, when you go to Africa, you give this to the man that God will show you. And he came and preached in the Church of God in Clarksdorf, called me out and said, young man, you know, uh, 76, he said, come here, this cloth, I must give it to you. And it prayed over me, and man, God hit me. And stuff like that happened in my life. You know, miraculously, certain things happened. You know, uh, one day David Hogan was ministering at a place, and he had a gray prayer cloth that he carried, and he said, uh, take that to that, that man with the long hair with the miracles in Africa. Just go give it to him. And somebody came and gave me. My hair was always long, you know. It's now with the chemo and stuff that it came off. And brought the prayer cloth to me. So certain Funny things happened with prayer cloths in my life. Oral Roberts sent me two prayer cloths, you know. And uh, I think Johan, I son Johan, because he loved Oral Roberts, uh, with his big hand. I mean, his finger is this much longer than my finger, you know. And he had that prayer cloth sent to me and said, uh, the miracles of the 46, you've surpassed the 46 miracles. You know, that's what he said, sent me a prayer cloth. And uh, when I was young and now, just before he died, two years before he died, sent me another prayer cloth. So I, I, I believe in the power of point of contact, our Oral Roberts taught it. So do we just want to anoint this cloth for you today and give it to you. And then the two of us are just going to lay hands on you and send you forth with uh, power and with glory. So that what we have, what we have will give we unto thee. Uh, one of my scriptures that I believe in ministering like this is Romans 1 verse uh, 11, 12, you know, right through 14. But he says, I long to be with you, to impart some spiritual gift to you, so that by the mutual faith of each other, we will both be encouraged. So when we lay hands on you, we receive energy from your youth. 
We released you the wisdom that we got in 30 years of ministry. And there's a mutual thing that comes. And that's why we, we stay strong in ministry. Because we always anoint. And there's this mutual impartation, this mutual. People say, how can you run like that? I mean, you just come out of a year where you've been six months just about in hospital, three months in ICU. You get up and you just go. It's that mutual thing. We lay hands on you and there's that intermittent thing, you know. And that's why we keep on doing it. Daniel, anything you want to say, brother? Um, or ask, maybe. Um, could, could you share some more spiritual experiences that you've had? Some more I, I, I know a lot of the team really wanted to hear, just because um, I think I told you two years ago, most grace preachers don't share that. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just tell you one. I, I, I started saying, at the next conference, I want to take one meeting and just see uh, experiences. I've got one, but it's I did it in 1994, uh, 14 tapes where I talked on uh, the uh, uh, experiences with the Holy Spirit. And I prophesied, this will be the year of the Holy Spirit. I said, it'll be a great thing happening in Canada. And two years from now, it'll be happening in America. And I prophesied the, the uh, uh, Pensacola revival, I prophesied, but other people did too, many other people did, you know, and the, the Canada thing with John Arnott and them, and when I prophesied it in 94, I said, and I'll be ministering there. I said, but it will not be in the place where they are now, it will be in their church, because they will be in the shop front now, but I'll be ministering. And in 2000, uh, I mean, how would John Arnott know me? I mean, how would he come to know me? And in 2000, our telephone rang, our landline, 10 past 12 in the night. I woke up, I said to Annelise, that's John Arnott inviting me. She said, you're crazy, man. How would John Arnott call you? How would he Kubis van Rensburg in Africa? I said, it's 10 past 12. Nobody will call me this time of the night. For them, it's morning, so he doesn't know. She said, John Arnott, come over. I wish he was here to church. She said, come over, go to bed. And I ran from our room to the lounge. I picked up the phone. I said, hello. He said, hi. Is that Cobus? I said, that's him. He says, the name is John Arnott from Canada. I said, yes. He said, uh, somebody gave me videos, you know, of your miracle pool and saw the cripples. Well, would you mind come sharing it with our people? I said, I'll come. Huh? Uh, I wrote it down in 94 in my Bible. I will be ministering in the year 2002 and 3. I'll be ministering in Canada. And uh, so things like that happen. You know, I was sitting in a Rodney Howard Brown meeting in Texas in 94. Uh, was it uh, whatever? And I sat there and he was ministering. Now we don't know each other from nothing, you know. And, and I said to the guy next to me, I wrote it down and I said, August 98, this guy will be ministering in our church. August 98. He said, Rodney will never come to you. Stillfontaine. I mean, I mean, Rodney will go to Johannesburg or Cape Town. Not to Stillfontaine. I said, it's all right. February, February 98. We're traveling in Johannesburg. My cell phone rings. I said to our youth pastor, that was then our youth pastor, I said, this is Rodney House Brown's offices in telling me they're gone. He said, you weird, man. You weird. I said, it is. I pick up. I said, hello. She said, hello. Uh, uh, this is, and she said her name, something from uh, Revival Ministries International, Rodney Howard Brown. I said, yes. She said, Brother Rodney asked, can he come have a series of meetings in your church? I said, yes. So the thing started rolling. People freaked out because it was written in my Bible. And so uh, they planned the meetings for April. I said, ah, oh, I missed it. I said, August. My wife said, he's still coming. What's the month? I said, I just, you know, August. <laughs> My Bible says August. He does. <laughs> so we organized, we printed posters. April, Rodney Art Brown's coming. The week before the meetings. They call, his father died or something, and he just can't make the meetings. Can he postpone it to the last week in August? I said, please, 
<laughs> so it was there the last week in August, you know. So things like that happened. But there's, uh, the, uh, what I'm trying to say is that year I prophesied it will be the year of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit report. And then I shared different like experiences. Like me and Annalise were traveling down on the south coast. Now you don't know South Africa, but it's two cities that's about, uh, say like 25 miles. No, it's longer, to kilo. Yeah. Say about like 56 miles apart. Okay, 56 miles, the one from the other. So we were in this truck, and uh, it had no gas in it. So I said to one of these, we've got to be at that meeting at 7.30. It's already, it's already 7, and we haven't got gas. We still need to stop at the gas station and put gas in the car. And when we got in the car, the people that we stayed with came and said, Kubis, we still want to bless you with something. And they gave us a, a tray of eggs and because we were missionaries and they gave us money for petrol. And I said, mm, look at the time. Mm, you know. And when I looked at my watch, it was 7.25. So we had five minutes to travel 56 miles. So, and we still need to put gas in. So we stopped at the gas station. I said, we're not going to make it. We're not going to. I asked them, hey, we're going to make it. I said, we will make it. I said, God will let us travel in three minutes. So I got in the car, put the gas in, and there's like three minutes. And when I looked at my watch, I said, three minutes, well, let's go. Whatever time we get there. And the next minute, we're in front of the church. It's still the same time, but we saw everything. We saw all the road signs. The two cities that we had to pass by, the small, small city, small city, small city, we saw everything. We saw the, the traffic lights. We saw the stop lights, stri streets. We saw everything. But it was like, I looked at my wife, looked to the front. We're standing in front of the church. So awesome. Okay? Yeah. So we got in a car. And the, uh, if you know cars, the one ball joint completely broke out of the whole stabilizing unit of the car. So the car's wheel phew, fell out and the car fell on the floor and the wheel was standing like this. I'm jumping out, I said, wow, that's bad news. Got back in the car, slender, and Annalise said, what are we gonna do now? I said, put your hands on the dashboard. I said, Father, thank you that this wheel is gonna lift up now and this car's gonna be fixed up. There goes the car. Boom, she says, are you going to check it? I said, no, we're going to drive it. And we just went. You know? And that we had a couple of times with a back wheel bearing that broke at a time. We came around the corner and tluck it, tluck it, tluck it, tluck it, tluck And I said, I don't accept this. I said, Jesus, we're so far from any town. I thank you, this wheel. So cars we had often, 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 cars breaking down, God healing cars. Uh, we had a storm year uh, about four or five years ago, yo, it was so great on this roof. And I went on the stage and I said, and I wonder, yes, I wonder who will stop the rain. But you can't, I've got to my mother, who will stop the rain? And I said, stop. And everything stopped. <laughs> There's nothing, not a cloud, no rain, no nothing. Everything's just gone. People freaked out. The one little guy <laughs> said, said to his mother, said, uh, that's what I said, the universe. We said, well, he said, what does Uncle Kubas do when he says stop and the rain just stop? Uh, two years ago, uh, we were in a drought and I prophesied, I said, Tuesday, five o'clock. Is that right? Tuesday, five o'clock, it will start raining all over South Africa. Tuesday, five o'clock. Saturday night. Sunday, Afternoon, people started phoning. Yeah, but the weather bureau says a month, maybe two months, there's no rain in this country. I said, Tuesday, five o'clock, it'll rain. Our doors were all open. It's clear, clear, clear skies. I prophesy again. I, I use the scripture in Joel chapter two. You shall prophesy and I will show wonders. I said, I prophesy and God will show a wonder. It'll start raining to you. The next minute, it's pitch black outside, lightning. <laughs> Gone. Clear skies. I said, that's a sign and a wonder. Tuesday, 5 o'clock, the emails started coming in. Telephone calls. Kubis is raining here in our city. Kubis is raining in our city. Kubis is raining in our city. Kubis is raining in our city. Okay? I think one of the greatest experiences, there's many, there's, there's books that we need to write a book on it, but because I love the word, 
I don't do this often. You know, but people say, but we need to hear the other stuff too. But I honor the word so much that I leave the stories. But the stories is good. The greatest was when, uh, yeah, the greatest was when I, 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 I dreamed from my side. I thought I was dreaming. And uh, I, I was in this rice lands. And this big China guy came to me and he said, you must not be here. This is not the right place for you to be here right now. You can come here later. But it's too dangerous for to, you to be here. Right. And I saw people in a car with guns coming at me. And all of a sudden I'm gone and I'm in another city. Now I'm dreaming. I'm in another city. I'm on this airport. And I look at these pillars and stuff. And the next minute I, I'm in a, a train. And I travel in the train and I come to this banana field. And there's people, you know, and they got the, the tops tied around their waists and they got these bands around their heads. And I immediately knew these are Thai people from Thailand. And, I, and, and there's an, a British guy amongst them. And I said to them, um, can I just bring the gospel to these guys? He says, yes, we are missionaries from Britain. We'd love for you to speak to the guys, you know. And, uh, and I, quickly I shared with them the gospel in short. And I said, do you want to receive Jesus? And 70 people came out and gave their lives to Jesus. The next minute I'm back on the train, back on the airport, and I wake up and I fall asleep again. And people come to me and say, uh, if you take a compass, you realize you are now six something, whatever it was, the countryman, six something from, say, New York, six from Johannesburg, and six from Jerusalem, something like that. So I woke up the next morning and I said to only, I had this weird dream, man. Oh, but it's so real, but it's so weird. So I took a compass and I took a world map and I put it on the three cities and I drew circles and they all crossed, you know, the three circles crossed at Bangkok, which is wow. the capital of Thailand, you know? And I thought, hey, this dream was very real. Two weeks later, I tell the story to my brother, I tell the story to Annalise, my brother's a missionary in Madagascar. So uh, two weeks later, he invites us. He says, they've got a conference in Johannesburg, Sawi, South African Evangelism Association of World Evangelism. So different mission companies come together and they just share stories and, you know, try to get money and stuff like that for whatever they do. <laughs> and uh, here's this one guy speaking. I said, yo, this guy looks familiar. Annalise says, how can he look familiar, man? from Britain. I said, yo, he looks so familiar. And this guy keep on looking at me. And he calls another guy and he says, uh, you know, this guy has been my interpreter. But he doesn't say exactly where he comes from. He just talks about, you know, their missionary experiences. But all the other guys say, we are from Vietnam. We are from here. But he just talks. This guy just talks. And, but he keeps on looking at me and he gets this interpreter and this guy stares at me like nothing. So afterwards, my brother says, I want to introduce you to that British guy because he's involved with our uh, uh, CEF, Child Evangelism Fellowship as well. So we go to an apartment and we sit there and we had tea and the guy looked at me. He says, do I know you? I said, yeah, oh, you look familiar, man. Where do we know each other from? You know, he talks to this guy and I said to Annalise, that's the Thai language. She said, no, well, how can that be Thai language? She said, what language is that? He says, no, it's the Thai language. So he said, do you know Thai language? I said, I don't know. So he take tracks, you know, gospel tracks, and he put it out like this. He said, which one would be the Thai language? I said, that one. And then he took books with airports. I'm just making it short. And he said, which would be the airport in Bangkok? I said, that one. And he looked at me, and I, even the guy took, he said, then you are the guy. He said, two weeks ago. He said, we were in this banana field. I said, hey, 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 <laughs> hey. That was freaky, man. He said, two weeks ago, we were in this banana field, and we we're going to preach to these, guys, these workers there in the field. He said, and a guy got out of a train because the train goes directly through the banana fields. He said, the train stopped, and you got out. And you said, can I preach to these guys? He said, and when you gave the invitation, you disappeared. And we all looked for you. We couldn't find you. Oh. Mm. That was my greatest experience. Oh, oh, oh. That's so amazing. Oh. Yeah, it's awesome experiences. Uh, when the terrorist war was going strong, uh, one night I said to the people, I took the scripture, uh, praying always at all times, Ephesians 6, in the spirit for making intercession for the saints. I said, there's some saints that we need to pray for tonight. I really feel we should pray for some saints. 
and I realized where they are. And I could feel the city where they were with the terrorist war years ago. And we started praying. It's now worship. This is now warfare. And God said to me, count. I count. And we were 16 in the house. 16. About three, four months later, in a school hall, there were some missionaries and people from YWAM, you know, and uh, somebody said, why don't you go listen? I said, yeah, I'm not really interested in YWAM, you know, but let's go in any case. You know? <laughs> so we went, and they had Lauren Cunningham there, and he was speaking, you know, and uh, some other guy speaking, and then the one guy got up, and also, you know, look at me like, I know you guys, you know. And he said, I just want to tell you, uh, I'm a missionary and we were in this country. And uh, he says, and this one night we were just sharing out of the Bible and we were so scared we just felt something was wrong. He said, and when we looked up, the terrorists just broke into the door with AK-47s and they said, get out. He said, we all rushed out of the house and they kept us there. It was me and my wife, the farmer and his wife and their child, just a few of us. And there we were with AK-47. He says, the next minute, angels appeared. He said, they were so bright. They were so full of light. He says, but there was a guy amongst them that didn't look like an angel, but he looked like one of them. And uh, he said, and these guys just threw their guns down and fled. He said, and I quickly feel I should count them. And I counted them, and there were 16 of them, and they were gone. He said, but were well, you not amongst them? Uh, uh. So 15 angels and me appeared while we were praying in the Holy Ghost. Oh my yeah. goodness. And that's why uh, I feel it many times when I pray in the Spirit in our church. I feel like we're traveling and we're getting. I felt like praying. Then I find myself in Durban. And I walk into a spiritist meeting and I say to this medium, I break your powers. <laughs> and then weeks later, we would be in Durban and we, this, we will meet this woman and she said, it's you. It's you that came into our house. Oh. Mm. Spiritist, yeah. yeah. Didn't know I was doing it. I was praying in the spirit. <laughs> That's why we shouldn't just speak in tongues. We should yeah. pray in the spirit. You should, when it comes from your heart, it's a river coming from your belly. And you should not, no, no. You should, I say to the people, you can tape me. I never speak in the same tongue twice. Yeah. Never speak in this. I, I speak in diverse tongues. So when I open my mouth, I make sure I'm connected to God. Something's going to happen. Es marbe torda la ravite, smerda di halavaka, to jimbruga luste kate sheka dan elbracato, shoraha halamika te. So God is saying, if you will allow it, I will flow through you. I will not put you aside. You just open your heart's door wide. I will come in, and right now it will begin. That's what I just said, in the spirit. Okay? So, you practice it. You let it happen. So, we're going to pray over this clause. Is that all right? Thank you so much, both of you. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Yeah, thank you for Pastor Chris that's got the same spirit, and same anointing, same word. I think it's awesome. Those who draw close to me I shall lift them up Those who draw near to me I will lift them up You shall be set ablaze With the fire of my spirit You shall be set ablaze with the yearning of my words
when you're finished, when you're finished, you can get your prayer cloth. And God bless you. Thank you. The cloths that are over, you can take.